come back and do other stuff as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So hey everyone, thanks for joining uh, today. And uh, the title of our talk tonight is Introduction to DevOps, uh, Software Development and Practice. And just take a few minutes to introduce myself. I'm Christina Hupe, and I work at a company called GitLab. And my role is manager of community programs. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is just so you kind of have that context of, of what I do. So at GitLab, we give away our top tier of our software, which we'll get into what that is uh, for free um, to different communities that really align with our values and that maybe wouldn't otherwise have access to it. So one is education, so universities. We give our, away our top tier for teaching, learning, and research. If you want to run the university, obviously, then you have to uh, pay a little bit to use it for those kind of admin purposes. And then we also give it away um, to open source projects as well. So if you're a completely open source project and everything that you do is public and you're, um, you have an OSI approved license, then you can also get it for free. And then we have a smaller startups program where if you're, you know, if you're uh, building a startup and you meet certain criteria, then you can also get it for free. And the goal really there is to um, help, you know, people who are learning in, in your uh, situation, learning how to develop software and build code uh, to understand how to, how to use Git and how to use our tools and specifically DevOps. So that when you enter the workforce, you have that skill under, um, under your tool belt. As I mentioned before, I'm based in uh, West Lafayette, uh, Indiana here right next to Purdue's campus. And uh, the areas that I focus on are really innovation and education. So when I was a professor there at uh, UW-Eau Claire, I uh, helped build the first um, degree in the state of Wisconsin that brought together industry um, and geospatial technology uh, to really build a degree that would help students get a job in the industry and help move things forward. So that was a really, really great experience. And then uh, I also, I always say I'm a mom of athletes. <laughs> That's my second Second job, um, I have two girls who play volleyball, so it takes up a lot of time. And then I would love to connect on social. So, um, and Caleb, if you want, I can share the link to the, the presentation and then the recording too, so that people can um, manage uh, or access the, the links in it also. And then I'll share my job title there because it's kind of cool, I think, to learn while you're in school about different people's roles. So I have a little bit of coding background. I did teach Python uh, coding at Eau Claire. Uh, specifically within the context of GIS, but I'm not a developer, but I do work in tech. And I think that's always exciting to point out that you don't have to be a software developer, a coder to work in tech. There's a lot of different roles from marketing, um, technical product development. So there's a lot of things that your background can be used to leverage uh, in, in the tech industry. And I'm happy to talk a little bit about that. So um, knowing that you're all in an IS degree, you're learning some kind of software development, uh, and it sounds like you're already learning to code, maybe you've had an internship about that. And so we like to start off using Sweet Green as an example. I don't know, I, I know well, Claire doesn't have a Sweet Green, but maybe Minneapolis St. Paul does yet, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's a new, it, we like to say it's the Starbucks of, of salad. And the reason that we use this example is because when you think about buying a salad, you think that it, the company is going to be, you know, a restaurant or a fast food industry. When, when Sweet Greens had their, um, their IPO, which is their initial public offering, meaning that they entered the stock market and became a publicly traded company, they came on the market as a tech company, not a salad company. And if you've heard about Sweet Greens, what they have is an app that allows you to go on and order and customize a salad walk into the store, pick it up and leave. And that's the same thing as Starbucks. So I'm sure a lot of you have used the Starbucks app before, right? Same idea, but for salad. And you can imagine in major cities and metropolitan areas, how popular that would be with you know, healthy eating trends and eating fresh and all of that, right? So just to give you an example of why so many people are interested in learning modern software development is because every software, every company has to be a software company these days to be successful, whether it's logistics, food, service industry, there's apps, right? There's, there's tools that people use to order things. So it really becomes front and center in whatever you want to do. And I know that's why the IS and the business degrees are so, so popular at Eau Claire. 
So you may um, or may have not seen this before. Have you learned about the software development life cycle before? Okay, I see some heads nodding. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because you've already seen it. Um, but the idea is that when you're building software, right? It starts with an idea, you look at those requirements, you design it, and then you begin the development process all the way through testing, security, and ma maintaining uh, the software as well. So if you think about how you're learning, and maybe this is how, how you're learning at Eau Claire, is it's just you writing, working on a project, right? When you very first start out, you're planning it yourself, you're writing it, you're storing your computer and your code, um, or on, you're storing the code on your computer, and uh, you want to test it, you compile the code locally. But what happens if you want to, you know, share it with other people? How do you get it off your machine and share it with other people? Um, that's one of the, the kind of developer workflows that we talk about because DevOps is what we're introducing today. And it sounds like some of you already kind of know about that. At, at the heart of it is collaboration. So we like to take the example of working alone here to how do we work together as a team, which is what really how modern software um, is happening. So maybe you've learned about Waterfall or you've heard about the Waterfall software development. Okay, seeing some, some nods. And then have you heard about agile software development? Yes, okay, so you know the differences here. So really software development started out with Waterfall. And I always use the example of, uh, I won't date myself too much, but let's just say that uh, I was in college in, in the 90s. And um, we, you know, we would use, say, say we were playing video games, you would get a version maybe every year or every couple years, right? Uh, not every day or every couple of days like we do right now with the apps on our phone. And that method, the waterfall method was the original method where it went through that whole software development life cycle before something happened. And that was pretty slow, right? It was a handoff. And then we moved to agile where things are happening in smaller chunks. So there's a little bit more collaboration and things are broken up into, into pieces that are a little bit more manageable. So Maybe you've heard of sprints um, where you identify something and then you work through it and you, you keep doing, doing the sprints to move things along. And so maybe these things are happening together, uh, you know, designing construction and testing and deployment. And so, ad, you know, Waterfall evolved into Agile and Agile evolved into the next thing, which is what, which is what DevOps is, which is what we're here to talk about. So when we think about this challenge that we've talked about where you're collaborating, you know, or when you when you're when you want to collaborate in the workforce and you want to go from coding on your own to sharing it, you run into kind of two challenges. One is how do we collaborate and share our code um, with friends and colleagues or anyone? I'm sure many of you have put code on a zip drive or a paper on a zip drive and moved it around or you're using your shared drives um at Eau Claire, i know your it department is fantastic um, at, at managing the system so you're actually really really lucky because a lot of universities don't have such great systems um but then how do you run the code where so where someone can see it these are some of the challenges that we run into in working together and if we think about this traditional model we have developers who write the software, deliver the software, um, and do the thing, you know, changing the software every day. Then we have the operators who are looking at the stability of the service, the security of the service, and the reliability of the service. So if we put all these things together, waterfall evolving to agile, agile evolving to DevOps, uh, if we think about you know, working in alone to try and collaborate with teams across our company, we kind of start to see. Um, you know, the evolution of, of software development. And so when we're talking about DevOps, we're talking about the things that happen at the beginning of the, 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 the um, software development life cycle and the things that happen at the end happening together concurrently in, in, it, in kind of this infinite loop that we like to use. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So the dev is writing code, designing what you're going to build and creating it. And the ops is maintaining it, securing it and defending it. So all of the cybersecurity stuff that you're seeing, monitoring how your app is doing once it's released. And so if we have a formal definition of what DevOps is, we can say it's a methodology of software development um, involving culture, processes, and tools 
And really their goal is to speed up software deployment. So from the time to the idea, all the way through planning it, building it, testing it, deploying it, that, that, that should happen faster in DevOps. And that's really the goal. And a lot of that involves collaboration. That's why we're using this example of coding you know, on your own versus trying to code in a group project. I'm sure you've had a lot of group projects and you know that just the logistics of sharing files and timing who is doing what and when really slows things down. So I hope you can use that example in your mind and relate. I don't know if you've heard of some of these things before. I know you've heard of Git, right? We've already, you know, we've mentioned that. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of cloud native com computing, um, not quite yet. So that's working natively in the in the cloud instead of storing something on a local um, a local server. Automated deployment is that every time your application is ready and builds, it's automatically sent and available um, to your to your clients. So uh, there's things like shifting security left, and that means testing for security earlier, very early in the process versus with waterfall, you waited till the very end. And at, at that point, if there was a security problem, you had to go way back and things were extremely slow. So we love to close with this kind of analogy before we move on of the Microsoft Word document. And I know you're using, you use Word Cloud now, but back in the day, if you can remember this, um, you know, you didn't have Word Cloud. So you would write a file and you would say Sam version one. And then if you're working on a team, you would have to go hand it to, you know, um, Ryan version two and then Mary version three. And then you would, you know, you would get antsy and you'd start working ahead. And then you would bring the documents all together and try to try to get your paper in order. And it was a big mess. If have you have you guys used Google Docs before? So yeah. you can edit right at the same time and you can all be making suggestions and making comments and you're living in real time. So really 10 people in your group project could be working at the same time. So if you take that, that framework and apply it to writing code and building software, that's the difference between waterfall and agile and DevOps. DevOps is happening concurrently. Everyone is able to do what they need to do in that software development life cycle at the same time. And what it means is that you're able to accelerate the time, right? Accelerate your results, accelerate your security, um, and really move things along faster. So this is that um, this is that infinite loop that we like to talk about. And I know the language isn't exactly the same, but if you follow this loop, you could imagine that this is the software development life cycle. So you're planning what you're going to, to build. Um, you're going to create it, writing the code. You're going to make sure that it works. You're going to package it up, send it out to release, configure how it's going to work in the cloud, and then monitor to make sure that it's working. And in DevOps, the idea is that there's not a waiting game for the next phase. It's happening kind of all at the same, all at the same time. And sometimes every time you make a commit, there is a security check on it. And that's really what we're talking about by shifting um, security left. And what we found is that, you know, as this is happening, especially in GitLab, which we'll talk about exactly what GitLab is in just a minute, um, it's a single platform where all of this happens at once um, in a single data model. So everyone is using the same framework. And it makes things happen way faster. So when, when we're talking about the evolution of, of DevOps, right, we have Waterfall, Agile, and then DevOps. When DevOps first came about, there were a bunch of different tools that were being used to make it happen. And I, I know we've already talked about Git or GitHub. Um, so we're different than GitHub. And GitHub is one of our competitors. They're owned by Microsoft. And uh, they basically do the source control management, which is part of the puzzle. Uh, and that's where you store your actual raw code. So that's one example. I don't know if any of these other names look familiar. Have you heard of, maybe Symantec is one that you've heard of because um, it does virus scanning. Does that sound familiar? Yep, okay. I'm sorry. I've heard of Dyra, but not Symantec. 
Okay, uh, Jira. Yeah, so Jira is a really good example. Um, Jira is where you plan out what you're going to build. So it's very popular and agile. Um, and basically that they came up with the idea of tickets. So product managers design what's going to be built. And then the... Um, and then the then it's broken down for the software engineers and sprints. And the sprints are composed of tickets. And every engineer gets a ticket in terms of what they're gonna build. And when that, that set of tickets is completed, that's the sprint. So Jira is a really, uh, it's owned by Atlassian. So you may have heard of Atlassian. Uh, they have their own, uh, they have their own Git cloud uh, as well. And then these are some other tools. Uh, this, this one right here is called Jenkins. Uh, that is a continuous integration tool that every time you make a commit, it automatically builds your software for you and runs a bunch of tests on it. Uh, so that's a really valuable tool. But as you can imagine, if we go back one slide, right, we're trying to do all of these different things kind of automatically in a loop. And when DevOps first came about, it was connecting all these different things. So Jenkins is your continuous integration. Docker Hub is your cloud services. Symantec is a virus scanning. This is one of your um, source control management systems. New Relic monitors how the application is doing in the cloud. So how many pings it got, what's the response rate, things like that. So you're monitoring uh, you know, the transfer rate of data or things like that. And it was better than Waterfall and it was better than Agile, but it took a lot of work to connect all this thing, all these things. And think about just... You know, when you're working, if you have to log into um, the learning management system, I know it was different. We were using D2L when I was there, but I think I think you've moved to something else now. Um, but, you know, you then you've got to log into this drive and that thing and your email. And it's just sometimes it's a big mess. So think about doing that when you're writing software and you're trying to coordinate across all these different teams. It was kind of a mess. So what... Um, I kind of skipped through the different phases of DevOps because it gets into some details we probably don't need to cover tonight, but we've arrived kind of at the fourth stage of DevOps where all of these different things have been put into one platform. And that that's, that's GitLab. So we think about when we're building software, we not only need the developers and the security people and the operations to make sure that it's already working, but we need the business side. And it's obviously very fitting that we're talking with people in the IS department in the business college. But, um, you know, I know, I, I, I know based on what I know about IS curriculum, you're really focused on building software and applications to meet the needs of the business, right? And connecting those dots. And what's really cool about GitLab is that that happens in the platform as well. So at GitLab, the company, we use uh, GitLab, the platform, for our finance department, our accounting department, our legal department, our marketing department, our communications department. Our blogs are written and hosted and published through GitLab. So it's really a platform that can kind of extend. All of our, you know, all of our product managers are using it. Uh, that's how our engineering teams build everything. So all of this stuff is happening in one place. And you can imagine that that makes things a whole lot faster. So let's just look at kind of what this looks like diagrammatically. So um, if you've heard of Jira before, you may have heard of epics um, or story. You know, sometimes I, in talking with IS people at different conferences, sometimes I think they're called, um, is it storyboards? What's the common language that you all use in IS? Yeah, storyboards, yeah. Sorry, is that, am I remembering correctly? Okay, so it's storyboards. In GitLab, we would call those epics. And then epics are broken down into milestones and issues. And issues are similar to a task. So if you think about agile software development, you think about individual issues that are grouped together in a milestone. And when that milestone is completed, that's kind of your sprint. So it, it can be used, so we can still use the same tool to do an agile sprint if we wanted to. Um, but what the idea of DevOps is we organize everything into epics. And then let's say an engineer is assigned an issue. And once they're assigned that issue, they take a branch off the main branch of code 
and they create a merge request. And our language is, I, I know, Caleb, you said you use Git before, so you may have used GitHub or maybe you were using the command line Git. Um, so the language varies a little bit. Sometimes it's pull requests or we use merge requests. And a developer will go ahead and push code. And this is the magic right here. Every time code is, is pushed to the branch, there's an automated building, testing, and scanning that happens. And I'm going to show you kind of what that, that looks like in a simple way here in just a few minutes. And that's called continuous integration. So that's that CI. Have you, have you heard of CI yet? No, I haven't. No, okay. So yeah, this magic right here is CI. So every time a developer pushes a code, pushes code, then you can have your CI pipeline set up uh, to run. I'll give you a really simple example. Um, we use GitLab to manage our website. And if I were to use a really naughty, inappropriate word and on accident, let's just say I had a typo or I was copying and pasting something and I accidentally included something bad that I did not want to include and I didn't notice it and I pushed the code. We have a checker that automatically runs in CI that would throw a flag that said this is the inappropriate language or this is hard language. Another good example is that um, we use relative URLs. So if we're linking to something intern of our, internally in our website, we don't use HTTPS, backslash, backslash, about GitLab.com. We just start at the slash. And that makes everything shorter, right? And we use your code base. So if you were to include HTTPS about GitLab.com, it would throw, it would not let you commit the code it, or not, it would not let the pipeline pass. It would say, you've got, unrelative URLs in your code. So you got to go fix it and it tells you what line. And that's happening every single time. So you don't have to wait till the end. You don't have to wait till it's handed to the security department. It's happening at the time. And then you have collaboration and review. So your product managers, your engineering managers, your code maintainers can check it. Another really cool feature, especially super relative relevant uh, to IS is that you can review the application. So it actually shows you a preview of what your built app is going to look like before you push the code back to the main branch. Um, and then once it's approved, you merge and release and deploy it. And then you can monitor uh, and protect it. So I hope this visual kind of gives you an idea of what the flow looks like uh, when we're talking about DevOps. So this is a slide of our customers. And I don't know how many of them look familiar, but hopefully some of them stand out. So T-Mobile. Uh, T-Mobile is a good one that we like to use because everyone's seen T-Mobile commercials and uses, you know, and, and at least in this audience is going to know what a cell phone is. And uh, they are they build all of their code and run their entire company on GitLab. And so it's really an enterprise level platform. So it's software development that's happening across the business. Um, another one that you may be familiar with is Goldman Sachs. So they're obviously big, big in banking. We're huge in fintech. So you may have heard of UBS. You may have heard of um, Equinix. You may have heard of Goldman Sachs. Those are all uh, what we would call the financial tech industry. And if you think about banking and investing and the stock market and all of those things, obviously security are super, is super important. Uh, you know, making software fast to keep up with regulations and cybersecurity, all of that is essential. And they're choosing to use GitLab to build all of their, their software applications. Um, so there's, there's a, you know, you may recognize Axway, some other things on here, but this just gives you kind of a, a list. Um, so GitLab at a, at a glance, we have a, a SaaS or software as a, a service version where you can do everything uh, in the cloud. And if you look here at this left side, you can see that a lot of it mirrors the things that we were talking about. At the very top, you see your projects, you see your repository, all of the issues that you're looking at, merge requests, uh, maybe project requirements, that continuous integration, security operations, and the like. Um, I am going, I'll share this slide deck so that everyone can kind of go and, and check it out. Uh, the, the one thing I want to mention is that if you are, uh, interested in using it on your campus, again, we do offer it for free, 
uh, to faculty. Unfortunately, we don't offer it to students at this point in time directly, uh, other than our uh, other than our free tier. So you can sign up for a free tier. You get five gigabytes of storage and and some different benefits. And that's really for most of you. That will be completely fine. Um, but your department or your class can sign up through the faculty member, and you'll get our top features unlimited for free. So it's it's pretty easy for the the professors to um, to sign up and 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 use. And I just wanted to share again my social information and then some of the people. Um, on my team and what I want to do is go ahead and I want to jump uh, right in and show you a little bit and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So um, this is GitLab platform and I'm right here at gitlab.com and then inside of our marketing department is community relations is the team that I'm working on and within our our project here we have subgroups and projects so I'm in the education program and I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And then we have some more projects. So we work with some nonprofits. Um, we actually have a group called Shiny Rocks where it's really fun things that we want to work on that we might ha not have time to and we store them here. Uh, so you can kind of see we have different, different sub projects and I'm going to click on issues. So you get an idea um, of what we're looking at. So uh, let's take an example of, let me see, let's find a good one. Um, let's see. Okay, so we just went and visited Georgetown in person. And this is uh, PJ, is our education evangelist. And um, he's, he's not building software here. He's just using this to organize an event. Um Flights booked, hotel book, I approve. And then his current plan is, is linked in a document there. Um, we're communicating here on ordering shirts and here's his the links to all of his slide decks. And then um, I wonder, you know, I wonder if it makes sense to try this. And then here's his agenda. So you can see how we're kind of collaborating. And the nice thing about this is that everything is in this one record here and we can label it uh we can assign it a milestone pj was there last week so that's the due date uh we can give it a health status you know is it on track uh is it you know is it confidential who's working on it so this is a really simple example of something that's super relatable uh that we you know we can organize so this would be similar to like i mentioned a uh, ticket uh in jira and then I'm going to go ahead and click here. And these are issues that I'm perf I'm actually working on. Um, and this one is one that I created a couple of days ago. You can see where we get to go to Copenhagen in December. So this is everything that I'm assigned. You can see right here, everything that I'm I'm assigned. This is kind of my, my running list. I can also see everything that I've created. So here's some, some things that we need to, you know, to work on it. And right there, that indicates that it's confidential. So I'm going to go back to assignee. And I wanted to show you um, this one example because it shows we've had, we had a, um, a university, Johns Hopkins, reach out and question something about our terms. Um, oh, that's the wrong one. Hold on. Let me go back to the other one. Oh, darn it. Um, that's the wrong one. So I'm going to skip to a different example because that one is actually confidential. I can't show you that one. Um, but we'll look at an example of where PJ has actually taken an issue. So remember that Georgetown one? Uh, it was his first on-campus visit and he had some ideas on how he wants to add um, some details to our handbook. And our handbook is kind of like our website that we use to manage our workflow. And this is a merge request. So I think you've probably heard of pull request if you use Git before. This is a GitLab merge request. And basically he is proposing changes to the code. And the reason I'm showing you this example is because basically he's, uh, you, this may look familiar where you're adding things and taking things away, right? 
this is our this is our website. It's it's basically our handbook for community programs and how PJ kind of works. And what he basically said is this is this is what I learned about Georgetown and these are things I, I kind of want to remember. Um, is that these are the different lectures we can give. This is how I order swag for the students. Um, we tried doing a student spotlight program. We didn't get much traction. So he kind of took that out because we weren't getting a ton of interest in it. Um, and then he's talking about how he does those, those uh, visits. And then um, here's our guest lecture. So that's what I'm doing tonight is I'm giving a DevOps kind of 101 guest lecture. We have a sign up form and that's what your professor did uh, to sign up. And then um, we go ahead and use, you know, a standard email template that helps us organize that. So if you look at uh, the commits, you'll be able to actually see uh, his commit of adding it. And then I reviewed it and I noticed a couple typos. So he had a space there. Um, he needed a, another S there. And then if I click on the pipeline, you can see that these are the tests that are running every time there's a change to the code base. And the pipeline passed. Uh, there's a code quality test. There's a danger review. These are our linters. And it makes sure that uh, everything has a, you know, a unique theme. It's checking to make sure that there's valid topics. So the, I hope this gives you an idea of how that's building automatically. And if you were, you know, building actual code there, you'd be able to see those changes, uh, whatever code checks that you need to, whatever security checks. Uh, and this one actually is already ready to go. So I'm going to go ahead and I kind of save this one just for fun. I can start the merge train because it's ready to merge. The pipelines have passed and I can, it's added to the merge train. So everyone at the company is probably merging things. So I'll get in the queue. Um, and then, oh, was it telling me? Of course I've got a, um, I don't know why it's telling me that I've, oh, it's running again probably because uh, it, it's been, a, you know, it, it needed to, to run again since there were updates to the main branch since I ran it. Um, and then I wanna show you one more thing, which is kind of our to-do list. So here are, any time that I'm tagged in something, I get a mention in my, my to-do list. Um, so here's a good example. One of our team members is creating flyers um, for our company and he put together this flyer and he's asking for input and we're kind of working, you know, working back and forth. And you can include images in here. You can include links. Uh, you can do, you know, lots of different, uh, different features. Let me see if there's anything else. Oh, here's the one that I wanted to show you. I already had it open. Um, this is an example of, uh, working with our legal department. So we had a request to update our legal, uh, agreement and here are the details on why they want us to do that. And then here we are kind of, this is, um, a manager of legal and I'm asking him to review this. And then he's go ahead and saying, okay, I'm going to hand it off to Iris. He assigns it to Iris and then Iris and I work you know, are working back and forth. And then once we get, you know, feedback, we're going to go ahead and open a merge request and make, make the changes. Um, so I'm going to stop there and I would love to hear questions and we can kind of open anything else up that is of interest to you. Yeah, I have one actually. Yeah. Um, more of a personal level for yourself. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, what has been your biggest challenge you faced from transitioning from being a professor to the tech industry? Or yeah. Just in that itself? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. So the biggest challenge for me was understanding the language of uh, what people call things. I mean, I think everyone generally knows what marketing is. We think of it as advertising, uh, but we have you know seven different teams in marketing and they all have very specific goals and they use 
really specific language to describe what they're doing. And so I needed to kind of catch up on that context because as a professor, you don't, you don't really have that kind of, uh, you don't have that context and then you don't have the, the set of language uh, that they're using. So it takes a little bit more, uh, you know, reading and, and, and understanding to get, make sure that you're tracking what everyone is, is looking at. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to know uh, how, how you kind of found out about the lab and how you decided, like, oh, this is something I want to work for, type of thing, just because I know you transitioned from being a professor to now. So. Yeah, no, that's a super great question. So uh, GitLab is a really super interesting company uh, because they are, we're the world's largest all remote company. So we do not have a physical headquarter at all anywhere. Um, yeah, yeah, we have no, no office at all. And we all work wherever we want to. We have people who are uh, literally surfers and they live out of a van uh, in New Zealand and they, they surf and they have a, you know, a satellite connection on their van and they surf and they work during the day and you can see them in their van and that's, you know, they're on calls sitting outside on a folding table, um, working and surfing when they can. Uh, so one of the ways we've been able to do that is by using GitLab, the, the product. And I think for me, um, one of the frustrations I had with academia is that it, it moves slowly in terms of administratively. And uh, there's a lot of uh, emails really used a lot and a collaboration was, you know, kind of difficult. And so one of the things that really attracted me to working at GitLab is that we don't use email at all. And I think you can see why from the simple examples that I've showed you, uh, we work in GitLab issues and there's, it's so much faster and it's so much more collaborative to have those discussions right in the issues. Uh, and they don't, you can't delete an issue, they don't go away. You can close it. Uh, but you can always still kind of comment on something. So uh, the reason that I found it is that, so when I was a professor at Eau Claire, I started um, doing some consulting on the side just because I got interested in industry. And then I actually left and went to a company that um, was building a geographic information system that was open source. And so that company didn't end up um, making it. They were acquired by another company. And so I was left by trying to find a new job after we had moved to, to Purdue. Um, and I, I knew that GitLab was all remote and I was really interested in bringing uh, innovative technology to universities. So, uh, so I thought, well, you know what, this is kind of a perfect pairing that I can help universities adopt the way that industry is actually working, right? Because I mean, we, we go to IAS conferences, uh, I'm actually going to, one in Florida, there's an international information systems conference in Copenhagen in December. Uh, we just went to the one in Minneapolis, uh, which is where I met your professor. Um, and, and so we, we do a lot of speaking and with professors and a lot of them are still teaching waterfall. Um, and so, you know, some of them are still teaching agile, which is fine, but then making sure that everyone understands there's this, you know, the, the way the industry is working is moving towards DevOps. And it's important for students to get that knowledge and exposure. You don't have to jump in head first, but you can introduce the concept, right? And, and show how working collaboratively, collaboratively speeds things up. So that was really, yeah, that was really exciting and kind of ended up where I am. That's awesome. I also had a follow-up question to that. So how, how big is the lab? I mean, you said it's, there's no office, it's just a uh, remote base. So how does that work and um, how, yeah, how many employees are there? Yeah, so there are, oh gosh, there's over, uh, let me, there's over 1,600 last I checked. Uh, and you can go to meet our team and kind of just scroll through and, and uh, we used to have the flags here, but we had a uh, take, we have a lot of Ukrainian employees. So we were, uh, you know, being respectful of everyone's location, but we, we have a lot, we have 16, um, 1600. So you can see that there's 
there's a lot of, uh, let's see. Okay, so here's the latest, 2062. And then we have uh, lots of pets, uh, yeah. 60 countries in the world. Uh, and then um, we actually have a very large, we're open core. So we have contributors that contribute to the base of our platform as well. So yeah, and then one other thing I'll share uh, that you may find interesting just because uh, you are in uh, a business school is we have uh, something called the GitLab Guide to, um, to All Remote. And we've documented kind of everything that we do. And we have a lot of resources. So Harvard studied our company and um, we have a lot of, of, of resources for how people can work remotely, um, including the remote manifesto, which is, uh, let's see, we have some more resources here, but uh, these are all the articles that have been written. There's blog posts, there's videos. Uh, there's just so much information on best practices and what we've all done and the tools that we use. Uh, but as I mentioned, you know, we don't use email. Uh, we make a lot of meetings optional to attend and it's really focused on your output and your efficiency. So that's one of the reasons why we're able to spread across so many different countries and so many people. Would you find that by not having or making things optional and just focusing on the efficiency of your output, you guys, you see that that is getting more work done in the long run as a company as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. So we release every month um, and we've done that uh, since the founding of, of the company, which we're over 10 years old. Uh, so for a, a major software platform to release every month, is, is basically unprecedented. And the reason that we do that um, is, is, is because we're able to work so efficiently. So believe it or not, uh, we have a, one of our, our guiding kind of all remote principles is that you don't have to pay attention to meetings. <laughs> what is that? What, what even is that, right? Um, <laughs> so, so the idea is that not all meetings are relevant to everyone and that if you are having a meeting, it should really be very relevant to you. So all the time you'll hear top leaders in our company say, Oh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? I was, I was multitasking. I mean, that that's, oh, it's okay. It's efficient to do that because there may be things in the agenda that are not relevant to you. And when it comes to you, then you answer. Um, when we're, all of our meetings are recorded, uh, unless there's a, a, a sensitive, so I'm just going to show you this one too, get lab and filter. Uh, and all of them are on, on our unfiltered channel. And you can basically look at, you know, watch our staff meetings. Uh, you can watch our group conversations. Uh, you can watch so ev literally every meeting unless there's sensitive, you know, sensitive things. So you can see, you know, this is 17 hours ago. Uh, this is, these are actual meetings that are happening at the company. And every single one, we take notes and we speak in order. So there's an agenda ahead of time and you follow, uh, you follow the agenda and you write everything down so that if someone isn't able to attend because they're in a different time zone, they can ask a question ahead of time and their question will be answered. They can watch the recording and you're taking notes and you're linking everything constantly. And that's a really, really uh, super, you know, efficient, uh, efficient way to work. So not that everyone would want to watch all these videos, but um, I will tell you that when I have to miss a meeting and I'm, you know, I'm eating lunch or something, I will do that. Or let's just say I'm tired of standing here all day and I want to go fold laundry and I'll put on a meeting that I missed or, you know, an interesting conversation our CEO had with someone and I'll fold my laundry. So it's just, it's a really different way of thinking about kind of your work day. It's super hyper flexible. That's awesome. Um, another question I had was, I know digital transformation has been a big thing, especially with like legacy companies. So would you say that GitLab, especially being completely digital, has, has like a, a leg up um, the 
compared to like those other types of companies where they're legacy companies and they're making this long transition of becoming digital? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a huge focus for ours is for us is shifting, uh, helping companies make that digital transformation by uh, not only, you know, working remotely across the company and working with a single source of truth, but speeding up that, you know, that process by having everything in one place. So your security, you make a code commit, it runs, it checks, it goes, you can preview the application, all of that in one place. So that's a really big, um, really big focus for us. And if you're interested in kind of seeing how that all um, that all shakes out, this is a great page to look at to GitLab um, features, and it kind of walks you through, you know, how how is it you how do we use issues for team planning? Uh, lots of things that we just didn't you know have have time to get into uh, today, but this basically walks people through. And this is just, you know, this is just planning. We can go all the way down to security and running, you know, the tests right in, in the platform. So, um, and I think we actually have, yeah, accelerating the digital transformation. So we have a webinar here uh, and how we kind of help companies, um, companies do that. So yeah, that's a great, great question. And I can send a list of resources over to you. That would be, um, that you can kind of all click through and, and look at in your own in own time. So, yeah. Anything else? I think that, well, Carson said a question. He's a computer guy today. So, yeah. hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? I got this like about like team dynamics and storage dynamics. Like, what is being fully remote? How does that impact like your culture as a company? Like, you know, I need to go work through and what's happening. Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, we use a tool called Slack. Um, I don't know if you've heard of a Slack before, but it's a, uh, I know it's similar to Microsoft Teams, but it's a little bit, you know, more interactive. And we have um, some fun channels. So we have a cooking channel and a gardening channel and dogs, uh, Peloton riders, and um, just any, any, there's music channels, there's a surfing channel, there's uh, living out of your van channel, there's redecorating your house channel. So there's lots of fun ways to interact there. We also have a social calls every day. So if you want to just hop on a random call, um, we also do something called uh, coffee chats. So I, I had a coffee chat today where I literally, we just go to someone's calendar and put an invite on it. And we put a you know, coffee emoji and say, I just would like to meet you and talk. And sometimes it's related to business, but sometimes it's really just get to, to get to know people. Um, and so those those are different ways that we try to integrate into the way that we work to be social. Um, we normally have, well, normally in, in the history of the company, we had company-wide fun get-togethers in really cool places like South Africa and Greece and New Orleans. And um, I've been, you know, working here for, I'll be three years in, in November and we had three scheduled and three canceled. I'm sure you know why, I don't even really wanna mention it. Um, and so what they've done and said this year is, is give us a, a visiting grant. So you get you know a certain number of dollars to go travel anywhere that you want and just get together with people from the, the company uh, to just people met in Malaysia and San Francisco, I mean, all, all over the world and just did really cool stuff. So that helps. I will say as we get bigger, you definitely have to be more intentional about it. Um, and you also have to be really intentional about how you communicate. Uh, so you notice when I was scrolling through stuff, we were using a lot of emojis and expression and saying thank you and really just being you know kind and empathetic in the way that you communicate because digital communication, as I'm sure you all know, can you know come across a little bit differently. So um, so I would say it's 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 pretty great. We really limit our meetings. So we don't get a lot of Zoom, Zoom fatigue. Um, I will say my life is definitely, uh, I feel more, you know, connected and uh, my life is definitely has a much better balance than when I was a professor because there it was all extroversion all the time. Lots of people, 
never being able to close your door or have that moment to think. And when you're working remotely, you know, you can have these very strong, productive spurts and then, you know, go be social and be back and be productive and you can manage your own schedule. Uh, so like tonight, I, you know, I took Friday afternoon off because I was like, oh, I'll be, you know, working later and, and meeting this goal one night this week. So uh, there's no, you know, time card. There's no, you know, hourly schedule. You just block your calendar. So that makes it, you know, really flexible. And because everyone works that way, it's, it's kind of easy to, to connect. I, there's no, there's no, absolutely no substitute for in-person interaction for sure. Uh, and people who are probably really, really super extroverted might, you know, might miss that a lot more, but I think mostly everyone who's here, uh, does really well because, you know, you're at a remote company. So you came to a place where you knew you would be, um, able to kind of be that manager of one. So I don't know if that helps answer your question. Yeah, good. Thank you. Well, thank you so yeah. Much. Thanks for chatting and 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 uh, everyone for coming. I'll send some links and I uh, definitely look forward to seeing in touch. So. Yeah. Yeah. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, take care.